My name is Joe Peroni and this is the Rise Above Project. And today I want to talk about the importance of legacy and some of the problems that come along with legacy. Now, the first problem right up front with legacy is that you're not really in control of that. Legacy is what happens after you're not on earth anymore. And from my point of view, I would say that rewriting history, it happens a lot. But when people do that, it's really what I would call planned obsolescence of people. Now, just so we're on the same page, I'm going to read a definition of planned obsolescence. It's the policy of planning something with an artificially limited useful life so that he, she, or it becomes obsolete after a predetermined amount of time. This is usually done to keep the money flowing in a consumer society. Now, this is extra perplexing to me because I consider myself to be an existentialist. So I really care about people's lives and how they're remembered. And as, a, as an existentialist, I think there's three major goals in life. And number one would be to create meaning and purpose in your life. And number two would be to, to try to pursue your full potential in life as well. Now the third one, I would say, is to exist and make a difference as long as possible. Now the operative word here is exist. And what I mean by exist is, is that your death should not stand in the way of you being able to be a force in this world. Thoughts, your work, your ideas, all should be able to live on if they were really good ideas that were helpful to the human race. So how do we do this? Uh, basically, you don't die. How do we do that? Well, let's define what an existentialist would say about that there's three deaths. And the first death, uh, death number one, is when you get the diagnosis that you're gonna die. And some people are afforded this luxury, and some people are not. But if we really look at it from a realistic point of view, reality says that all human beings die. So if you're born, you have a 100% mortality rate. So speaking from a reality perspective, you don't need to hear this from me, but I'm gonna tell you, here's your diagnosis. You're going to die. So it's time to do something while you still can to be a helpful member of society. So that's death number one. Death number two is bodily death, when your body cannot work anymore. And what is what most people would say is the person died. And now the most important one that we're going to talk about for today would be death number three. And this is the final death. And this is when the last person on the planet says your name for the last time. It's when every idea and thought and every contribution that you've put into the world during your time on earth has been forgotten about and disappears. And that's the third and final death. So what we're really talking about here again is legacy. Who are you and how do you want to be remembered? And again, here's the problem. Legacy is a form of external validation, which means you don't have that much control over it. People have their opinions, they have their own agenda, and they rewrite history all the time. And from where I stand, I hate when people do that. They disregard people's lives. And in a sense, I think when you erase people's contributions, it's kind of like a virtual assault or a virtual murder even. Or you could say that there's a desecration of their soul. These things should not happen. The reason why people make people's legacies disappear is because a lot of times they're trying to sell something new. They're trying to act like they did something brand new and so they try to make you forget what happened in the past. And we're going to go over this a little bit more because I'm going to give you some examples of this. Uh, I do really think that there's too many people that are forgotten for no reason in the world. And there's just so many unsung heroes. <clears throat> At the end of the show, if you'd like, in the comments section, because I don't have all the answers here, 
I think it would be uh, really interesting and also can educate me if you know people in your life personally or other people in history that have been unsung heroes that have been forgotten about for whatever reason. And you can put those in the comments section because, listen, I don't care if you're a multimillionaire and I don't care if you're homeless. I think everybody's lives is worth something and we shouldn't just make them disappear off the face of the planet forever. So let's start off with something really basic here. And I'm going to read part of this article just because I think it's so interesting, interestingly written. But here's the first question for you. Who invented the telephone? I'll give you a little pause there. Because everybody's going to say it's Alexander Graham Bell. Because this is what we were taught. We learned this in school. Nobody questions it. There is uh, telephone companies with the name Bell Company, Bell Telephone. So we just assume that Alexander Graham Bell is the person who invented the telephone. But somewhere along the line, somebody's soul was desecrated, somebody's money was taken away from all their relatives, and somebody was just deleted from history. Because that's not, that's not the right answer. So let me read you this article real quick. <clears throat> Italy ha hailed the redress of historic injustice yesterday after the U.S. Congress recognized an impoverished immigrant from Florence, Italy, as the inventor of the telephone rather than Alexander Graham Bell. Historians and Italian-Americans won their battle to persuade Washington to recognize a little-known mechanical genius, Antonio Meucci, as the father of modern communications, get this now, 113 years after his death. The vote by the House of Representatives prompted joyous claims in Meucci's homeland that finally Bell had been outed as a perfidious Scot Scottishman who found fortune and fame by stealing Meucci's work. Just as a little more detail here, know that when he was in the United States, he lived in Staten Island, New York. And one of the reasons why he invented the telephone was because, first of all, he was poor. He died penniless. So with all of this, the other guy's family made all this money. His family died penniless, and they didn't recognize him until 113 years after his death. But his wife was bedridden, and he was still trying to work, and he was in another room. And he still needed to work, but he still wanted to contact his wife. So he invented the telephone so he could speak to his dying wife. That's a good enough story as it is for him not to be screwed over, but he was. So that's just one example. Let's go through a few. I know there's a million, but let's just have some fun with this. Number two, who's the first American president of the United States? George Washington, right? No, absolutely not. Here's some stuff they taught you in school, but we never really looked at the facts because we just listen to authority and we don't question it. So here's the first part. The United States declared independence from Great Britain in 1776. George Washington took office in 1789. You're talking over a decade there. Where did those lost years go? Nobody talks about that. You don't think that the United States had a leader? We absolutely had a leader at that time. That person was not called the President of the United States, though. So it's just a semantics thing. But did we have a president? Absolutely, yes. As a matter of fact, there were 14 presidents of the Continental Congress, which was the President of the United States. Now, if we want to play semantics a little bit here, the Articles of Confederation were ratified in 1781, and they also nominated a president at that time, and that person was John Hanson. And it's interesting because if you, if you look at this a little bit more, what you'll find out is that John Hanson's relatives had been up in arms for years about this, trying to say, well, at least you could say that the Articles of Confederation were ratified in 1781, and he took over. You at least have to give him credit for being president for that. And so they've been pushing for years to no avail. He's obviously not on the dollar bill, nothing like that. Now, the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1787. George Washington took over after that. 
So we're really talking semantics here about United States president, who is the first. It certainly wasn't George Washington. Now we have 14 human beings, 14 souls that have been desecrated, 14 families that have been desecrated because they get nothing in history books. And it's just, it's just not right. Again, planned obsolescence of people, not a good thing. Listen, I can understand planned obsolescence in a sense, right? Because they can create light bulbs that can last 20 years. But if you bought a light bulb and it didn't, it didn't go out for another 20 years, the people who sell light bulbs are not going to make that much money. So they have to have planned obsolescence. They make it so it's only a certain amount of hours and a light bulb goes out, so you have to go back to the store to buy a new one. Um, I can kind of understand that, although I still think that that's wrong. But with human beings, no. That's, <laughs> that's definitely not the right thing to do. Let's talk a little bit more about history before I talk about a sports example for you. So here's a question. So who went on a midnight ride to warn the colonists that the British were coming? Everybody knows this, right? It's Paul Revere. Yeah, he did. So Paul Revere went on a 20-mile ride to say uh, one it by sea, two it by whatever he said. I forgot. I don't know. But he, he did warn the colonists that the British were coming and the war was going to start. No doubt he did that. But that was a 20-mile ride. And the name Paul Revere, that's a great name. We could all admit that. But there was somebody else that was there that night. His name was Israel Bissell. <laughs> Doesn't really flow off the tongue. Not very exciting. It's hard to rhyme words with Bissell. And so he kind of got eliminated from the story. But here is the story about Israel Bissell. His ride was 345 miles over five days through five different states on multiple horses because the horses dropped dead because he kept dry, uh, riding, riding, riding. And there you go. So his ride was 325 miles longer than Paul Revere. Why don't we not know this? Why is he basically been obsolete. And here's why. Because a very famous poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, wrote an 11-verse poem about the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And so the Bissell family gets forgotten. But not really. Because if you um, go to a store or maybe you're vacuuming today, the same family as the Bissell family, they own vacuum cleaners, so I guess they got back in their, in their own way. How about that? Let's take a look at sports for a second. Now, uh, the Super Bowl was just maybe about a month ago, and everybody's talking about Tom Brady now being what they call the GOAT, the greatest of all time. It's hard to deny that. He's played for 21 years. He has uh, tw uh, 10 Super Bowl appearances and seven Super Bowl wins, which is absolutely amazing. They say that uh, it's unparalleled. Nobody's ever done this. Or has it? Maybe it's a semantics issue again. Because football didn't start when the Super Bowl started. There was a lot of football played before that. The Super Bowl is just a commercialized thing that everybody says Super Bowl instead of saying football world championships. So let's take a little look at that again. If you look up Super Bowl champions, what you'll find is that Bart Starr from the Green Bay Packers won two. Seven to two, Brady wins. No issue here. Or is there? Because before the Super Bowl, they had world championships, and Bart Starr with the Green Bay Packers won five. So that means he won seven world championships. It's the same as Tom Brady, and he did it in less time. And he did it when football players actually had to play football. They don't even play football anymore. Half of it is two-hand touch. You can't really hit the quarterback. You, can't, you let the receivers just run down the field, do whatever they want. You can't hit them in the head anymore. You can't hit them too hard or else you're going to get a penalty. So every single rule that they have now is to encourage the scoring of the offenses. 
So it's not even the same game. And yet we're going to uphold Tom Brady. Why? Because it just happened. So we forget about the past. Those were people too. They should never be forgotten, is what I'm saying. It's disrespectful. Let's take another look at this. Because let's take a look at Otto Graham. Who's Otto Graham? Didn't play in a Super Bowl. That's why they don't mention him. But I'm going to. Let's start off from the beginning. Otto Graham graduated college. And then when he got out of college, his first two years, obviously he was in his prime. Did he play sports? No. He did this, uh, he had to go to this little thing called World War II. And he fought in World War II for two years during his prime. And when he came back to the United States, he did play professional sports. He played basketball. And here's the thing. He won the world championship. Now, back then, I think it was called the NBL, not the NBA. But it's still the same league. It's still the world championship. His team won. He literally won the world championship in basketball. Now, Paul Brown, who owned the Cleveland Browns, saw him in college play football and said, this is a great athlete. I want him on my team. He paid him a lot extra. And Otto Graham joined the Cleveland Browns. He played for 10 years. This is what happened in the 10 years. The Cleveland Browns and Otto Graham were in the Super Bowl every year he played, 10 years in a row. And he won seven world championships, just like Tom Brady, but he did it in less than half the time. And if you want to consider the other championship, he won a basketball world championship. There is absolutely no way in the world that anybody could put Tom Brady in the same sentence as an Otto Graham as who's going to be the better athlete. It's just not even remotely close. Let me prove it even more to you. And to this day, he still has, Otto Graham still has the highest win percentage of any quarterback. Now, a very important stat is the, is the yards per attempt. Otto Graham still has the record for that. It's like nine yards per attempt. Now, just to give you an example, Tom Brady is 29th on that list. It tells you a lot. I don't want to get into detail on that because it's a whole different subject, but it means that he dumps the ball off real quick. He's, he, and he's playing in a league where he's not even allowed to get hit and he's still just dumping the ball off here and there. He's not throwing the ball way down the field, although he's very capable of doing that. I, I get that. Here's something else that's really interesting that really just puts it all towards Otto Graham as being the better athlete. There's a reason when you see old pictures of him in the first three years because he's wearing number 60. Why is that? Because he played defense. He, was, he actually literally played on the defense as well as being the best quarterback who ever lived. Now you're saying, well, he just stood there. He didn't do much. Mm, that's not true. He had seven interceptions in the three years that he played defense, and he had one interception in the championship game. So he was the winning quarterback that also had an interception. Here's something else about his athletic prowess. In the years, 10 years that he played, he had 44 rushing touchdowns. Well, let me go back. 44 touchdowns himself. One of them, he returned a kick, it was a touchdown, and the other one was for an interception return. Absolutely amazing. That should never be forgotten about. We should never forget about him. It's absolutely disrespectful that we do. Tom Brady's great. Let's talk about Otto Graham, right? So let's talk a little bit more here. Um, I know that music is extremely you know, up to one's opinion, it's very subjective. I understand that. But there's some things we could talk about with music, how people's legacy is just kind of tarnished. And I want to mention uh, Terry Kath. Actually, his daughter put out a, um, a biography on him because, because of that reason. She felt that his reputation was absolutely tarnished. And you're probably saying, but who's Terry Kath? That's the point. So let me tell you who Terry Kath is. Terry Kath is probably the most underrated guitar player of all time. He was the founding member of Chicago. 
He was their lead singer as well, and he was their principal writer as well. But he always ended up fighting with management and the other band members because they wanted to move towards a very soft contemporary, you know, adult contemporary music. And he was more of a hard rock player, leaning towards blues, and of course with the brass section, he liked jazz. So he was much more of a, a uh, progressive in terms of music, and he was pushing it. He, it was actually, the original uh, Chicago was called the Chicago Transit Authority, and they were actually a very hard rock band. Now you might say, well, who else would agree that he was a great guitar player? Well, this guy right here behind me, Jimi Hendrix, was quoted as saying when he saw Chicago play, he said, wow, that guy's a better guitar player than me. So Terry Katz's biggest uh, fan was Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix literally said that that guy was better than him, which I think that holds a lot of weight and most people understand that. But if you look at Rolling Stone magazine and they have the best guitar players in the world, blah, blah, blah. Terry Kath is never even in the top 100. But there's a reason for this. There's a reason why his legacy was absolutely eliminated and destroyed. And unfortunately, uh, he was cleaning a gun when he was 32 years old and there was a bullet, whatever, and he ended up killing himself. From there on, obviously he had no control over the direction where Chicago went, and he obviously was not, had no voice anymore, so he lost. So he was trying to hold back this real elevator dentist music that the other guys in Chicago wanted to play, including Peter Cetera, who was a good musician, but obviously not a hard rock musician. So they changed, and they didn't just change their music, they changed everything. They changed their producer. They had the same producer that produced Celine Dion and Kenny G. And then they put in other writers. And the same writers that wrote music for Cher and Michael Bolton. So here we go. Terry Katz's whole legacy, even though he was on par with Jimi Hendrix as a great guitar player, it was absolutely diminished because of Chicago's decided direction change that they wanted to play soft music and now nobody remembers Chicago as this hard heavy rock blues band and that's true so I just wanted to mention that although I know music is obviously um, everybody could have their own opinion but yeah Terry Kath is to the people who know that love guitar Terry Kath is one of the greatest guitar players who ever lived that nobody knows who he is because the people around him did not preserve his legacy that well. So I hope you enjoyed today's show uh, about the importance of legacy. Uh, let me leave you with this. Although legacy is not completely up to you, you do have to control the things that you can control. And by that I would say, be the best person you could be. Try to be a good person to other people. Try to be uh, live a meaningful life that helps people all the time. Do the best you can. Have your thoughts and ideas and the things that you put out on this earth. Hopefully, if they're good enough, they can outlast your own life on this earth. And do that. That's what you can do. And then you have to hope and you got to pray, cross your fingers, that the other people that are still alive carry your good name. And that's, I think, the best we can do. And again, so I'm very much into you know, giving respect to people who walk this earth and who are not here anymore. I think it's very disrespectful not to give uh, the people that just do. I don't know everybody, and I don't want to keep going with this because I could do this all day. So if you would like to leave comments in the comment section about people that you think that are unsung heroes, and I don't care if they're famous or not, better that they're not. If they're family members, put them down. You know, I, I'd like very much to see it. I hope the show was valuable to you. Again, my name is Joe Peroni. This is the Rise Above Project, and I will speak to you soon. Thank you.